Shannon. Okay, this is an interview with Jackie DeShannon. In the world of popular music, few singers are able to continue for over a decade. Our guest is one of those. Jackie DeShannon, welcome to KCSN's 10th anniversary. Thank you. It's fine. The reason I'm laughing is because a friend of mine says, I'm coming by tonight, and I want you to tell me how you've stayed around so long. <laughs> Um, thank you. I don't know. Uh, I started uh, about 1960 and 61, the back half of 59, and I was sort of uh, just writing and singing, and I came to California as a uh, singer, songwriter, and um, started producing records, and um, got several contracts for friends of mine, and uh, had people like Leon Russell and that whole Le Glenn Campbell for demo people. They were playing you know, for demo rates, and uh, we were just all kids, you know, just sort of hanging out and, uh, um, you know, making just a lot of demos. In those days, there were really a not, not a lot of people doing their own songs, you know, they would try to, the publishers would try to peddle them off and to whoever had a top ten record, such as they did with uh, Carol King in those days, you know. She didn't, as you will notice, have a, a Carole King album when she was, you know, first writing and having a lot of hits. So I don't know if it's a blessing or, uh, you know, uh, a curse because when you wear a lot of hats, uh, sometimes uh, one or one hat gets lost. So uh, people say, well, what do you do? You know, are you a writer first or are you a singer first? Or are you an actress or what? what do you do? Well, um, you know, they're all very close to me because when I first started singing, which was in uh, church, you know, I sang gospel music, and um, my grandmother played English folk music and my father played country blues and my mother was a, a blues singer, so I sort of grew up with different kinds of music. My aunt was a teacher at the Conservatory of Music in Chicago, so I heard everything from Prokofiev to Jimmy Rogers, and uh, it's... You know, so I just sort of grew up um, with many different loves, and I continued that. And I was very much at home um, producing and very much at home writing and, and sort of felt the need to uh, switch from singing. Like I would go on the road for a while and perform and then come home and do nothing but write. And then I would feel a need to get into the studio and produce someone else and get outside of myself and... And I found some a guy by the name of Delaney Bramlett, and I produced a couple of singles with him. And nothing really happened until later with him. But uh, it's really interesting. And I sort of hung around in California and, and sort of uh, tried to, um, you know, find new groups and uh, uh, saw some a uh, group called the Birds and the Spoonful when they were in New York. So I would go back and forth from New York to California. I saw Bob Dylan's first concert at Town Hall and uh, I wanted to come back and record a whole album of his because I thought he was going to be the James Dean of rock and they said he would never sell. And, you know, just sort of getting caught up in, in um, different um, uh, uh, perspectives in the sense that uh, the label I was with sort of believed in selling singles and not really building artists and pushing songs. And, I mean, it was much different than, say, a Vanguard label, you know, where uh, they would take people like Patrick Skye and John Hammond and Joan Baez and different people and just keep pouring album out after album after album out, where well, my company was basically a, a singles record company. And I remember once I went to England, and I had a song come, called "Come and Stay with Me," which was written by Marianne, which was written by me, and recorded by Marianne Faithful. And I wanted to record it, and they said, "No, you haven't had a hit record, so you better give it to her." So you know, it's material is very important, and I believe that I, you know, could have had a lot more hits. I mean, strung them together much better had I had an opportunity to record them, you know, the way. I felt they should be done, as most artists have a lot more control today than they did, you know, when I first started. Now, you had, before you had your biggest hit, or, which was What the World Needs Now is Love, and... and 
well, What the World Needs Now was probably one of your first big hits. You had several local hits, which were hits yeah. here in, in Los Angeles. Do you want to tell oh, us about some of those? I felt very embarrassed because Jackson Brown came up to me at the Troubadour and he said, one of my favorite songs is You Won't Forget Me. And I'm going, you won't forget me, what's that? Oh, you know, that, that was a song that went top five here. And he said, I just really like the bridge a lot. And I, it was funny because I couldn't remember the bridge. And I had songs, oh, I don't know, I was uh, the little surfer girl or something, I don't know. I just sort of, they never could get the records going outside of Los Angeles. I remember Needles and Pins was top five here. It was top five in Detroit, top five in Chicago. And all across the nation, in every big city, it was top five. But at the time, it would be top five in Chicago. It would be top 30 as it was coming down in Detroit. So they never could really coordinate things for me on that particular record. And then the searchers covered it. And, uh, of course, you know, people were familiar with it, and it went, you know, very high. And then I did a song that I wrote called When You Walk in the Room that they never could pull off the ground here and uh, the searchers liked it and they did it went to number one in England and I don't know I've had sort of a, a really weird uh, career I've never been able to string a bunch of hit singles together and so I don't know whether that has sort of forced me to do other things or whether I've chosen that route and then when I had what the world needs now is love I chose not to go on the road I was in art school at the time I really loved art school, and uh, I, you know, nothing could drag me out of it. And I rode horses every day, and I went to d different classes, and I just could care less about traveling, which is the attitude of a lot of, um, you know, um, stars of today. They don't like, you know, they like take six months and travel, or two months and stay home and write. Well, in those days, I was considered really freaky because you just don't do that. You know, you have a hit record and you put on your sequin gown and off you go. And I remember appearing at the Ash Grove, which was the ethnic place to appear at the time. And uh, that was at the time the troubadour was considered plastic if you worked there. And um, I was singing needles and pins and traditional folk music. And I had people like David Cohen and Roy Cooter backing me up. And and I had, and a reviewer wrote, well, you can't do rock and folk at the same time. That's impossible. It's, you know, you, she should be strung up or something. And um, two years after that, it was the biggest thing that, you know, really hit the country. So it's gone like around and around. I've had, you know, different facets. And then I, I took um, you know, acting classes and did um, Virginia and the name of the game and, um, you know, just and did a couple of films and... Uh, just sort of really chose exactly what I wanted to do. I didn't have a manager at the time because I had, you know, a couple of very, very bad experiences with both managers, with both managers and agencies. So I just really preferred not to just let the chips fall where they may and really not pursue a career. I can remember one of my friends, uh, Barry Feinstein, who's a very good photographer, he did the last album cover that we had on Atlantic. And he said, when are you going to stop playing and really get serious about getting in the business? Because I just, you know, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. You know, just really never uh, try to string things together or pursue something. And I did an interview with Robert Hilburn, and I was try uh, here. And it was really hard trying to tell him, uh, you know, what was going on in, in, the, in the 60s and... Uh, and then you go and see American Graffiti, and I'm, uh, one of my tunes is The Great Imposters, and I can't believe, you know, that I have um, been involved very heavily with music. And still, you know, I can see myself lecturing when I'm 80. I can see myself still, you know, producing and writing and singing. At least, you know, I hope to be progressing. And I think one of the um, things that probably has... Um, been responsible for this is my goals have always moved up you know once I achieved that well I said well this is you know I know that I can handle that I'd rather I'd like to move on because then I found that I did not get bored with singing or I did not get bored with writing or acting by sort of doing all of them instead of just you know but one at a time you know not trying to wear every hat at once but uh, it was fun like making this new album with Joel Doran who 
produced Roberta Flack and Bette Midler. And it's funny because I worked with a group of musicians that, that I toured with for, you know, a month. So uh, you just never know what's going to happen to you. Um, Ralph McDonald, who wrote Where is the Love and Bill Salter, they are very instrumental in the album, as well as writing several tunes. And then I wrote um, a couple of tunes with Vinnie Poncia, who wrote a couple, several of, of the Ronettes, you know, bigger hits, and was in a group called Trade Winds. And then I wrote a song with Donna Weiss, which is um, my new single. And it's called Now Your Baby is a Lady, which should be coming out shortly. And... Uh, it's just, it's really interesting how, you know, I, I, for instance, did a concert with Roger Miller, and I was in an album called Laurel Canyon, which I felt was completely lost and really not uh, promoted and, and, you know, exploited as it should have been, because I thought it was one of my, you know, really fine, finer albums in the sense that it was constructed mainly of just, you know, a rhythm section. And, uh, in fact, one of the vocal one of the people doing vocal background was Barry White. I mean, it's just, you know, all these people that that I discovered, you know, like before anybody was working with him and I was touting them before anyone was sort of, um, you know, aware of them. I remember taking uh, all the people that participated, like James Carmichael, who does all the Jackson Fives arranging. He played piano for me, and Barry sang background, and and uh, we did a concert in Houston, Texas, and we did a gospel song, which um, had never been done. I mean, I was on a bill with a guy like Frank Gorshin, and for us to come out with, uh, uh, what's the cream I was getting near? I um, can't think of the name of it. That's where I'm going. It's Sunshine of Your Love. And um, we we did the whole Laurel Canyon album. We just said, we're going to do something for you that's, you know, I don't know if it's been done here before, we're going to present a brand new album in concert and see what you think of it. And we got to the gospel song, Too Close, which is a traditional black gospel song. People were just in tears. It was just incredible. And nothing like that had been done. I... Uh, dropped by a rehearsal yesterday, and now uh, they are doing an album with um, a friend of mine, Eric Mercury, and they're taking a whole thing, what we did, and now Al Bell is going to do it, and he's taking it to Houston and recording it live. So I just have sort of, what is what is um, uh, Dr. John's song, was it the right place at the wrong time, or something like that. But I sort of feel that what I was doing so ten years ago is, as you know, the times is sort of catching up with me rather than um, you know the other way around. How do you feel uh, about the music scene today? Where do you think it's going? Well, I I'm a basic. Uh, well, I'm an old uh, believer in in material, and I think I'm, my first love is is the song, and I think if you have a great song. Um, an adequate singer can do it. Do you know what I'm saying? If you have a um, a wonderful song, I don't. I really think it's kind of hard to stop it. You know, if you have that kind of a song, like a "What the World Needs Now" or a "Put a Little Love in Your Heart." I mean, I'm glad that I was the first person to do them, but uh, I mean, had another person done them, I don't know if they would not have been hits. You know, I like to think that my interpretation meant a great deal, but I'm. Being a writer, I am a believer that if you have a quote-unquote hit song, that's where it all begins, because then the arrangement is built around it, and, uh, you know, an, an engineer and a decent producer, I think, you know, you have, you have a shot at the ballpark, and I think the people that program music is what is holding up music today. I think the fact that they don't play more records and that they only play the same top 10 or top 15 records, even though they say they're top 40 radio, I don't believe that they are, that they play, you know, 20 records, and what there are no, there's no such thing as a smaller record market. I think they're just as, you know, picky, if not more, than a larger record market. You know, like, we don't care what it's doing in Chicago, this is New York, or this is California. And I think uh, music is going to depend largely upon what radio does, because it's so difficult. You know, I think there are many great records that, that haven't even had a chance to be 
heard, I think, a group like Fleetwood Mac, which has really not broken through to the extent that I felt that it should have broken through, which caused the original group to break up because they were not, you know, making what they should have been making and selling the way they should have been selling simply because they didn't have the, the airplay that they should have had. You know, most of the groups that were FM are now trying to cross over into AM because they realize that that's where uh, your your money is because the people that mainly buy tickets to concerts, I feel, you know, are uh, basic, your basic AM audience. I, I think that there are, um, you know, I think Van Morrison, for instance, and I've done a couple of shows with him and I've recorded, in fact, I'm on, on his new album, Seeing Background, and I did several concerts with him. We appeared at the Troubadour together. I think uh, he was not selling, and I think Astro Weeks was one of the finest albums to ever come out, bar none. And he had Blue Money and Wild Nights Are Calling, which are certainly not, to me, the Van Morrison of Astro Weeks or of Moon Dance, or to me, his greatest works. And, and the overall public became aware of Van Morrison and really got into him when when Brown Eyed Girl came along. And this is certainly, to me, only just a flick of what the, the, the man is capable of doing as what's on his new album. I mean, you know, he was doing this nine years ago, but, but before Blue Money and, and these so-called, you know, little top 40 records and, you know, um, AM Records made it, and which, you know, opened up uh, everyone's eyes. And I think once you you can string a group of top 40 records, or, or say AM records together, uh, then people start digging out your own material, because Carole King had several albums out before Tapestry. You know, I mean, and Aretha Franklin was on Columbia many years. Is that to say that she's not the same talent that she is on Atlantic? But she strung several AM records together, top 40 records, and people began to dig in and dig back into old Columbia albums, and now she's out of debt with Columbia. Do you know what I'm saying? Did I, I hope I made myself clear. Okay, let's take a look at some of the tunes that you've written. Let's start off with uh, Put a Little Love in Your Heart. How did that tune come about? Well, it came about at the time my brother and I were writing with uh, um, Jimmy Holiday, who'd written several things for Ray Charles, and... Um, my brother uh, and Jimmy and myself wrote Bad Water f for the Railettes, and this was after Put a Little Love, but uh, he uh, was a big fan of Gladys Knight's, and we were trying to come up with a song for Gladys Knight, and so he came upstairs one day and started playing me this, um, these chord changes and said, what do you think of it? And I said, I really like it, I think it would be great. And so I, I put a melody over the chord changes and we had a couple verses and as I said at that time we were writing with Jimmy so we just called him up and said you know listen to what we have which was to be force of the song and uh, so we went over and sort of tidied it up but that's how it came about. And the tune of Vanilla Ole which was uh, sort of a hit about a year or two years ago how did that come about? Uh, uh, well um there's a, a restaurant in the city called Figaro, and they have a drink on the menu called uh, Banana Ole or something like that, or Vanilla Ole. Anyway, it tasted like vanilla, and I really thought it would be a really nice title, but the title, it, people didn't understand the title, and they kept asking me, what does Vanilla Ole mean? And I really could you know, that's what it meant to me. That's like saying... And I could never understand why they would ask me, what does it mean? Because when you go out, five different people can go and see a film, and you're going to come out with five different opinions. So I could never understand how they could have the nerve to ask me what it meant. You know, what does it mean to you? I know what it means to me. Uh, I just, you know, wrote the song, and all the things, if you listen to the lyrics, uh, those are the things that, you know, the words, what they meant to me. And maybe when you hear the lyrics, you will identify in some other way. Maybe one line, you'll say, oh, yes, this makes me think of this, and I relate this to my life in this way, which is, to me, what music and art and uh, poetry are all about, is, is how you, Id what makes a person buy a record or buy a painting or, or buy anything is because they can identify with it. And the person that, that made it or put it together, be it a desk or, or furniture or art or anything, maybe had an entirely different concept than the person that bought it. But somehow they both hooked in on, you know, they identified with it. 
Of all the tunes that you've recorded, whether they've been big hits, small hits, or nothings, do you have a personal favorite? Ugh. Um, well, that's really hard to say because I get so involved with what I'm doing at the time that every th the things that I'm doing at the moment are, you know, become my favorites. However, there was a song on the Laurel Canyon album called Hollywood, lyrically, which I think probably wa is one of my most favorite lyrics that, that I've ever written. In fact, Hugh McCracklin, who's played on just about every female singer's album, or every album that's cut in New York, said that it's one of his favorite songs, and he's going to record it lyrically. I'm, you know, was really, really pleased with it. On your new album, how much of the material have you written? I have three songs on the album. As I said, uh, uh, Joel Doran produced it and uh, Antigia Music, which is, was heavily involved with Roberta's uh, music. They sort of, we sort of put together what we considered the best material available, no matter who wrote it. Um, I had already had the three songs that I recorded on the album placed with, with other people that I had to take back. Uh, I really didn't intend to have any of my own songs on it, but um, somehow three of them got on there. They're written by different people. Stephen Swartz, for instance, who wrote Godspell and Mass with Leonard Bernstein and, and uh, Pippin that's running now on Broadway. Stephen just accidentally came in the studio and he said, because I bumped into him at a, the Rolling Stones concert here last year, and he said, my God, I know who that voice is. And he came running in the studio, and I said, well, do you have a song, you know, that's not in a show or something? And I don't, you know, what do you have? And so he sat down at the piano, and he played a song for me called That's What I'm Here For. And we all fell in love with it, and we recorded it. And Ralph uh, and uh, McDonald and Bill Salter had a couple of songs and that we all fell in love with. And then um, when I was touring with Van... His um, pianist, Jeff Labus, kept playing a song called Break Through the Gates of Sorrow, a gospel song. And I just fell in love with it, and I've been carrying it around on my little cassette player and playing it for everybody, saying this is the greatest song in the world. And I thought it was written by someone in, in the Bible Belt or in West Virginia or, or Mississippi, and it turns out to be it was written by the uh, drama coach at Yale. And it's just, you know, sort of in Congress, things like that. It's a very different album. Some of the songs are done mainly with a rhythm section and percussion, and other songs are done, um, you know, with a large orchestra. For instance, Doc Palmas wrote one of the songs called You're Still Gonna Be My Star, and he's had, you know, so many hits. It's, you know, I can't even, I don't even know where to start. Going back from Lonely Avenue, from a very early Ray Charles album on Atlantic, which is one of his finest works. And um, it's, I don't know, I think it should be a really, really fine album. When can we expect this album out? I had hoped that we would have it in time for Christmas, but uh, Joe wants to really take his time in sweetening, sweetening meaning adding different percussion instruments, adding strings, whether or not to put strings on, whether or not to put horns. And you just sometimes have to take a vacation. We worked three months on it, two months on it, three months. And he wants to, you know, just sit back and study it a little bit. The single will be out shortly, but uh, I think after January you can expect the album, which will have a black and white cover, things like that, sort of. And uh, there'll be a, a story in Rolling Stone forthcoming about parts of the album and mainly about uh, a lot of things about my background that uh, I'll have to mail to you. And maybe, you know, during the course of this, uh, airing, you can be, you will be able to add things from that. I don't know exactly when it's coming out, but it was a two-day grueling interview, and so, you know, it's just impossible to, to get it all out here. But you know, I'll send you a copy of it, and maybe you can add some other things. When you're not busy recording, writing, what do you like to do in your free time? Oh well, I sort of stormed up here in a fury because I'm writing a treatment for a film that I've been wanting to do for about five years, and I've had this idea in my mind, and uh, it's just something's taken hold of me and said you must do it now, and now's the time to do it, and now's the time I should be in Maui, which is an island off of Hawaii, but uh, something is just you know really pushing me to do this, and I feel like I have to do it. You. 
when you're a creative person, you really don't know when these streaks are going to come. And when they do come, you know, you better sort of like riding with the surf. You better get on, on the board and ride with it. Otherwise, you know, it's lost forever. Is there anything that you have not done that you would like to do? Oh, <laughs> thousands of things. Um, you know, I've wanted to do a show with uh, uh, an art show and music together with sculpture from each, like, say, in Chicago, find sort of several different artists doing with paintings and sculptures. And I've, I've talked to several people about this, and I understand that now some of the artists are going to do it. But I was, I've been talking about it for like six years, and I think it's sort of floated around the circle, and it's going to be taken away from me. But that's one thing I'd very much like to do. Um, ex you know, bringing music and art together because some people are so afraid of art that they won't understand it or they can't, you know, that it's, it's far beyond their mentality, which it isn't. And sometimes if you put the two together, because music seems to cr be able to cross all barriers, and if you can sort of, if I could put art, you know, right on the same level as music and have it there and have music, you know, have it going back and forth and and the main thing is for people not to be afraid of, of art, you know, and that it's above them and this and that because I think they're very closely related. Now we're going to do something a little different. We're going to give you three wishes. Oh. What would they be? Oh, that's terrible. And I have two minutes to make up my mind. Well, I first of all wish um, something that uh, I think everyone in the world wishes, that, and that's peace on earth and goodwill towards everyone. I, it's hard for me to believe that in a society and the mentality of people that can, you know, have a rocket on the moon that we can't pull ourselves together and uh, try to be friends with one another and, uh, uh, you know, not have a, have a, a black quota and an Indian quota and a Jewish quota and, and all of these things that still exist in America today when, when rockets are landing on the moon. And, I mean, I just can't believe that, you know, that there are still places, I mean, that, are, that there are colleges that, you know, have all these things going down, that there's still prejudice. I mean, it's very hard for me to believe that that still exists, and it does still exist. And I think, you know, that would take care of... Uh, of uh, my three wishes because what what we all I think would like to do is just you know like to live in peace and and leave something for humanity I was watching the Thomas Edison story the other night on television and you know it just made me cry to think about here you know and, and when people are out spending every day of their lives trying to find cures for cancer and all kinds of diseases and here I am worrying about whether my records gonna go on top 40 or not sort of leaves you a little empty. So, you know, I just just hope for things like that, about just a better world. Jackie, thank you very much for being part of our anniversary. Hi, this is Jackie DeShannon, inviting you to tune in Spotlight on a Star every Sunday night at 9. Each week, host David Schwartz presents the music of some of the most popular entertainers of the past and the present. People like Benny Goodman, Bing Crosby, Anne Murray, and Jackie DeShannon. Thank you, David. <laughs> That's Sundays at 9, right here on KCSN.